Okay, so things we know about substance use. The reality is that we are not all equally at risk. Some of us are more at risk than others. We are lucky or unlucky, but we are born with different genetic predispositions that put us differentially at risk for all kinds of health outcomes, one of them being substance use outcomes. And the way that we know this, one of the ways, is that we do twin studies. So twins essentially come in two types. Is anyone here a twin or a parent of a twin? Twins are usually, at, used to be about one in a hundred births, now it's more like three in a hundred. Rates of twinning has been going up. But they come in essentially two types, monozygotic or sometimes called identical twins, single egg fertilized by single sperm. At some point during cell division, they break in two. And so what you essentially have are genetically identical individuals, individuals who are sharing all their genetic variation as compared to dizygotic, or sometimes called fraternal twins, who are, come from two eggs fertilized by two sperm, just like ordinary siblings, except it happens at the same time, so they share an intrauterine environment. So what you end up with are a pair of individuals who share half of their genetic variation, just like ordinary siblings. So when you have twins that are raised with their biological parents, what you have is this beautiful natural design, whereby you are varying a pair of siblings in how much genetic variation they share, but you're keeping their environment, their shared environment, same parents, same neighborhoods, usually same schools, you're keeping that constant. And so if we want to understand if something is genetically or environmentally influenced, we go out and we collect thousands of twin pairs, and we look at how similar are MZ twins and compare that to how similar are DZ twins. And what we have found for substance use as well as uh, most all health comes that are, outcomes that have been studied is that individuals who share more of their genetic variation turn out far more similar than individuals who share less of their genetic variation. And this has really been pivotal in starting to change that conversation about if substance use was all environmentally influenced, if it was, for example, being raised by a parent who had a substance use problem that caused children to then have problems, if it was having a bad environment at home or in your neighborhood and that was all it was, then we wouldn't expect any difference between MZ and DZ twins. But for virtually all health outcomes, we find that individuals who share more genetic variation are more alike. So this is about how heritable a variety of different psychiatric and substance use outcomes are. So the kinds of things I study, alcohol and uh, drug outcomes, somewhere here in the middle, about 50% heritable. And you can see that sits somewhere between anxiety and depressive disorders and eating disorders, and at the higher end, more severe mental illness like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And just as a point of reference, Listed also up here are other kinds of medical conditions that are similar in how genetically influenced they are. And I always put this up to remind us, and I know that this audience needs no reminding, of the stigma that continues to exist because often my students are shocked by things like blood pressure is no more biologically influenced than alcohol use outcomes. And so I think that this kind of message is important for continuing that conversation and raising awareness. But it turns out that twin studies haven't just been done for biomedical outcomes, they've been done on all kinds of outcomes. So there have been twin studies of divorce, there have been twin studies of voting behavior, there are twin studies of how religious folks are, there are twin studies on happiness, and virtually everything that has been studied shows some degree of genetic influence. And the reason that I mention all of this is because it reminds us that there is no gene or genes for any of these outcomes. And that seems pretty clear when you say, well, clearly there's no gene for divorce. There are genes that influence our behavior that maybe make us more or less likely to become divorced. But I think we forget that sometimes when we're thinking about medical outcomes or something like substance use. There are no genes for substance use, but there are genes that influence our risk. So what does that mean? Well, it's important to remember that 
all genes do is provide an instruction booklet to code for proteins, and then proteins are the building blocks that influence all of the things that impact the development of our bodies and our brains. And it's those differences between us in our bodies and our brains and our behavior that influence our risk for substance use outcomes. We are still a far way from finding all the genes that are involved in substance use outcomes. It's estimated that there's probably thousands of genes that increase or decrease risk, each of them just a little bit. And I work on some of these very big gene finding projects where we're trying to, under, uh, to identify those genes and understand what they do at a biochemical level. But in the meantime, what we can do is we can understand something about what are the intermediary mechanisms? What are the variations in our bodies and our brains and our behavior that are on this risk spectrum that, spectrum that are much closer to what actually changes our risk for substance use outcomes? So one of the things that we know is that there is no one pathway. There is no one predisposition to developing problems. That genetic predispositions can show up in different ways across development and that they, they can be conferred in more than one way. And here's a little bit of what I mean by this. In one of our projects, we followed an entire birth cohort of kids born in a large geographical area in England. It's about 14,000 pregnant women who were followed from the time that they were pregnant, and their children are now in their mid-20s. And we got a grant to study their substance use, and one of the things that we asked is, how early could we predict who was going to be our risky adolescent alcohol users? And we had reports that the moms made on their kids, starting from the time they were born, what they were like as infants and as toddlers and as little kids. And we found that we could predict who was going to be a riskier alcohol user in adolescence with moms' reports on their kids' behavior before age five, not when they're babies. It turns out temperament starts to kind of solidify around two. Before that, it's mostly how, how frantic moms are with uh, dealing with new babies. From about two to five, kids' little personalities start to temperament, start to stabilize, and their own temperaments start to come out. And we actually found two groups of kids who were at risk for increased substance use, and they were two completely different groups of kids. One group were kids whose moms reported that they were having emotional and some behavioral challenges from the time they were young. And the other group of kids were kids whose moms reported that they were highly sociable little kids from the time that they were young. And this reminds us that there's many different pathways to substance use and for some individuals to substance abuse. And we talk about in some ways there being, and though this is an oversimplification, three kind of primary different pathways that you might think about. One of them being physiological, the way our bodies actually respond to drugs, which differs between individuals. And this is the one that I think when most people think about there's a genetic predisposition towards some people being more at risk for addiction than others, I would say this is the one that I think most people think of us. Think of, some of us are more likely, our bodies are just more likely to become addicted. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it turns out that this externalizing pathway is actually the highest risk pathway. And that is through individuals who are more impulsive, more sensation seeking, who like trying new and different things that might be a little dangerous. I have a highly impulsive sensation seeking child the other day I was reading a little, these are the things that the child of a clinical psychologist has to deal with, reading the kid's book of questions, because what could be more fun than that? And the one we opened up to was, if you could do one thing that you're not allowed to do right now because you're supposedly too young, what would it be? And my 10-year-old, without a moment's hesitation, said, tie between drive a motorcycle or drink beer. <laughs> 
neither of what she sees me hanging around the house doing. So he has been that little impulsive temperament since the time he's two. It's fascinating to study the high-risk child, or to raise the high-risk child that you study. An internalizing <laughs> pathway is another pathway that we know individuals vary on and can lead some individuals to be more or less likely to develop problems. And this is that some of us are more predisposed toward being anxious or to developing depression and falling into a pattern of drinking to cope. So when we talk about physiological response, this actually is an area where we know a little bit about the genetics. So we know that there are genes involved in how our bodies break down alcohol. And so, for example, there are some genes that make it incredibly hard for our bodies to break ethanol down into its byproduct acetaldehyde, which is then broken down and eliminated from the body, or that we can do that first step but then can't break down that kind of toxic intermediary byproduct. These individuals who carry this particular, these particular genetic variants are more likely to feel sick, to feel nauseous, to have flushing, et cetera. Turns out that's highly, highly protective against developing alcohol problems when you get sick every time you drink. That's really the minority of the ways that genes influence risk for addiction, though. Another way that physiological response can affect risk is, and this is, a Linda, Linda was alluding to this earlier, we differ in how our bodies respond to alcohol. So how many drinks it takes before we start to feel the effects of alcohol. When it takes more drinks to experience those effects, that can put you at increased risk of developing problems because you have to drink more to get the same effects that your friends are and then you fall into usually heavier drinking peer groups and that can then lead to the subsequent development of problems. But as I mentioned, though we know more about this physiological risk pathway, it's actually these risk pathways that are the majority that play more of the role in how at risk we are for substance use. And Jasmine's going to be talking quite a bit more about this externalizing pathway. In our college students, this happens to be a, uh, some data from our Spit for Science project, which I'll be talking more about tomorrow afternoon, we ask them, why do you drink? And you can see it maps on to these different types of risk pathways. The majority of them saying to enjoy a party, they like the feeling, but also with this significant but smaller number of students saying, because it helps when I feel nervous or depressed, so that others won't kid me about my drinking. So what do we know about how genes influence our likelihood of developing problems? We know that genetic influences play a role. And I want to also clarify that when we say things like the heritability of alcohol problems is around, on average, say 50%, it doesn't mean that 50% of the reason that Danielle Dick or John Smith or whomever, your loved one, developed alcohol or other drug problems is because of their genes and 50% because of their environments. It means that 50% of what causes the differences between all of us is due to differences in our genetic makeup. So it's not, doesn't tell you for any one person, it just tells you at the level of our society that we know that about half of the variation between differences in people's substance use is due to differences in their genetic makeup. That said, there are no genes for substance dependence. There are genes that influence the way that our bodies respond to drug, drugs. There are genes that influence our personalities, our predispositions, and that can make us more or less likely to use drugs and to potentially develop problems. A key piece here, though, is that our genetic predispositions are not our destinies. And I love how Linda talked a bit about that with respect to her own family as well. So if we imagine that it is extremely difficult to get access to any kind of alcohol, then genetic predispositions are not going to play a big role in differences in how much people are using. We won't use much because we can't get it. 
And you can think about how that can extra extrapolate to a variety of different situations among individuals who are part of certain religious groups where there isn't alcohol use, then if you're not using, doesn't matter what your genetic predisposition is. And there's all kinds of other ways that in a less extreme way, you can vary that. So if you have adolescents, we know that more parental monitoring, less opportunity for kids to use, you can reduce the expression of their genetic predisposition. You can perhaps redirect it in other directions if you have your highly impulsive children like I do. I frequently, I talk about my poor child who at some point is going to become cognizant that he's a uh, centerpiece in all of my scientific talks, but he comes by it honestly. My father, my brother, his father are all fighter pilots. Who becomes fighter pilots? highly impulsive, sensation-seeking individuals who have found another way to channel their predispositions. So for those of you who are interested in this, I actually have a TED Talk where I talk some about how the environment can change the importance of genetic predispositions as well. So with that, I'll end by saying one of the things that I think we as researchers have been extremely bad about is getting out of our labs and talking to individuals other than other scientists about the science, about what we know, and about how we can think about how we can use this information, for example, about different pathways of risk to think about how we can develop better prevention and intervention. And I'm extremely grateful for partners at the Division of Student Affairs, like Linda Hancock and her uh, shop there at the well, Tricia and Kristen and others, so that we can all work together to tackle this really complex problem. We're actually partnering, and though it's not ready for prime time, are working right now with another company on how we can develop more personalized prevention modules for college students that are not a just say no model, but are instead a understanding yourself and your predispositions and what they put you at risk for and whether, what are other ways that you might channel them. And next up, are gonna, we're, I'm extremely uh, grateful to Dr. Jasmine Vasileva for being here, who's going to talk much more about that externalizing risk pathway and about some really interesting work that she and her colleagues are doing, doing more personalized prevention that takes these factors into account at the younger school age level. So Jasmine, uh, so thank you all very much, and we'll get Jasmine set up. <laughs>